All right, here we are, we're in module one. Now, this class is all about database and we're using databases to support a business and essentially help us to make better informed decisions as managers. Now, why would one want to make a better informed decision? Why would we not? No. We want that competitive advantage over our competition. I want to be able to make decisions and not waste resources. Now, resources are all too often what we call scarce. Money is a resource, isn't it? I've got to work hard for my money. I don't have somebody just walking up to the house every day saying, hey, here's a thousand dollars. Thought you might need it. That just doesn't happen in the real world. So we have to go work for our money, earn our money. And in business, there's always somebody else fighting for that same dollar, that same customer, whatever it may be. Now, we've all been somewhere and as we're checking out at the checkout counter, they said, uh, what's your zip code, please? Think anything of it? Well, three three four one zero. Why would they collect that? And from a business perspective, they want to know where you live. Why is that important? Somebody decided where they were going to build that store or open that store. Was their decision right? Is that where the customers are actually coming from? We need to be sure that the decisions we've made are the right decision. What if we find out that 90% of our customers are driving 25 miles to come to this store that we opened? Apparently we opened the store in the wrong place. If we open it where our customers or clients actually live, is that going to likely boost our customer base? Improve the frequency of their visits, the amount of time they spend or money they spend with us? Those are decisions that if I've collected the data and I can derive the information from it, I can make a better informed decision. So we know the why. Why are we doing it? How are we doing it? Well, how? We just, I just said it. You walk into the store, you go to check out, and they said, what's your phone number? Aha, they collected data about me. Now they've got my phone number. What can they do with my phone number? Well, they could sell it. And when I, these things that I'll say, it's not a conspiracy, it's not all the world's out to get you. When they're Just putting it in the real context. They're collecting your phone number. That phone number, is a unique identifier associated with you. My address is a unique identifier associated with my home. There's a table somewhere that has records associated with my phone number or associated with phone numbers. There's a table somewhere that somebody's created that has the address as the unique identifier. There aren't two houses with the exact same address, are there? I, don't, I only see one house where I live. So if somebody says, what's your address? You're talking about the full address, the street address, the city, the state, the zip code. That's the full address. And if you want to get down to it, the country, there are not two houses here. That's a unique identifier that the Postal Service uses. Now, there may be an apartment, an office, or something like that, but that building or that address is unique. So now I've gone to the store and they've collected this data about me. They've got my phone number associated with what I just purchased. I don't know why you needed my phone number when I just 
purchase some stakes for a camping tent. But when I went to Bass Pro Shops yesterday, they actually asked me for my phone number associated with my purchase of little metal stakes to hold my camping tent down. Why would they do it? They're collecting data. What they're going to do with it? Like I said, they could sell it. They could use it for something. They could use it for a marketing campaign. Maybe send me a text. Somehow they may be able to associate my phone number with my email address. Somebody's got that data collected and can sell that information. That's another way for them to reach out to me to market me. Now, we've all been online and went shopping for something. And then the next thing you know, you're on social media and here's an advertisement for what we were just looking for yesterday. Potentially talking about to somebody, well, we've looked for it usually. And when we go looking for something, they store data on our computer in the form of what's called a cookie. And they're having us keep track of the data for them. And then when we go on social media, our social media account interacts with those cookies to see where's he been, what's he looking for. Let's market those things to him here. Wow. More data being collected. There's a cost associated with having that person ask me what my phone number is. A cost. It took time. They had to ask the question. They had to type that information into their computer. How long did it take? Even if it took 30 seconds. Yeah, it seems insignificant. It really does. But on a good day, let's say that representative interacted with 200 customers. 30 seconds times 200, mm, that's 100 minutes. 100 minutes, that's over an hour and a half just today. An hour and a half of their time just to collect data, ask phone numbers? How much do they make in an hour? Oh, they're making $15 an hour, an hour and a half, $22.50, and fifty cents just to ask somebody the phone number day by day by day. It didn't seem like a whole lot until we tied a dollar value to it, until we looked at how much time is associated with it. Now that's just the data collection. That's not the storage and maintenance of the data. These things we need to think about ahead of time. Who's going to collect it? Where are they going to collect it? When are they going to collect it? How are they going to collect it? In what form does it have to be entered? What data types are we going to use? So we're going to create a database. Before we ever get to this point that I'm at here on the screen, where I want to create a blank database, the first thing that I need to do is plan it all out, much like I'm going to build a house. I create a floor plan and blueprints before anybody starts working on that house. And I got a bunch of people go review them and approve them before we ever start. Why? Because we want to make sure that this thing's going to last. It's going to be reliable. It's not going to take a breeze and just blow it down. I want it to stand up to a storm. I want somebody to feel safe in that home. When it comes to my data, I want somebody to feel safe when they use my data to answer questions. I want it to be reliable. I don't want it to be unreliable. Okay. Now with that said, let's assume at this point we've already created the map of our database. We know what tables are going to be in there what relationships will exist. We know maybe not all the questions we're going to ask, but we've got an idea of the types of questions we're going to ask of the data. What kind of reports will we need? How's the data going to get entered? 
all these things that we need to think about ahead of time. We've already gone through and answered those questions. And now we need to create the database. So we're going to create a blank database. And it's not going to be a template. And I've got the latest version of Access. And I popped right through. I should have given it a name, and it gave it a default name of Database 3. It's only the third time I've created one and didn't give it a name. By default, by default, and default means that you didn't say anything specific about how you wanted it. So we're just going to give you what everybody gets. By default, it will name it Database and then a sequence of numbers. And it also is going to give you a default table. Here's a table. You can't have a database without tables, so we're gonna create one for you to start with. So I'm creating a database. It's given us a table. I'm seeing the table now in data sheet view. You see that little icon there? Kind of looks like an Excel spreadsheet icon. That's data sheet view says I have record one of one. So I've got a table, there's only one record in it. If I come click on design view, it says you need to save that table and give it a name. So it's created a table, but it hasn't given it a name yet. Gave it a tentative or default name of table one. Um, let's call it student ID, unique identifier to identify a student. I say, okay, now I've got a student ID that's going to automatically create a number for me, and that is my primary key. Talk about it later. May talk about it a little later now in this module, or we may wait till you module two to talk. But let's look at the big picture. It's where we want to focus. This first module is the big picture, creating the database. So this database will have currently a student table, student ID table. I'm going to go back. I, you know, I really want to change that. I don't want to call it student ID table. I want to rename it. I said, wait a minute. That thing's open. You can't change the name while it's open. You're accessing it. So go ahead and close it. I don't want to call it student ID table. I want to rename it. I'm going to call it the student table. So there it is. It's the student table. I want to create another table. I could just create a table for me. Table design. Hmm. Let's go with this. And I'm in design view, field name, call it faculty ID. I want it to auto number. I'm going to go right click here on the name of it and say save. So what do you want to save it as? I want to call this my faculty table. Yes, I want a primary key, and that will make that that faculty ID a big primary key. So, close this. I've got two tables, a faculty table and a student table. If I double-click that object, there it is. Now, let's look at it in design view. Instead of just ID, we'll call it student ID. So, I've got a student ID, unique identifier for student, then I've got a faculty table. Now, I could also have a course table. And these things are all things that I would have created beforehand, the different fields for each table. I'm trying to expedite this because of the amount of time it takes to create these fields. brief an overview as I can because these videos could be hours long if I went on and on about it. You've got 
other videos that I can point you to to dig deeper and focus on each one of these items or these aspects. So I've got a faculty table, I've got a student table. What do faculty and students have in common? Hmm. We'll go create another table. We'll call this one a course table. And we'll keep track of our courses. Now look at it design view. I'll call it course ID. I don't want it to auto number. I want it to be short text and it will be seven characters long. Okay. Come back and look at data sheet view. Let's save it. Looking at data sheet view. This course is CGS 1543. Right? Now Go back to design view. I've got course ID, that unique identifier. What else am I going to have? I've got to have faculty in there. There's a faculty ID. Oh, there's going to be students in there. Hmm. How many students am I going to have? Wow. I'm going to have to find a way to bridge together my students and my faculty with a course. So we're going to have to come up with something that will allow us to have students and courses together. Now we only have one faculty for the course. Let's go ahead. We're going to bridge these things. And I, right click and I can delete that faculty off of there. I'll create a course name. That'll be long text faculty. I've opened up the faculty table design view. I'll create F name, L name, short text is fine for both those. Student. Let's look at the student table, student ID and design view, do F name again, and L name. So, I've got a table of students. You've got an ID, you have a first name, you have a last name. Uh, date that you started with the college. A number of different things I can collect in here about you, about any student. Okay. Same thing when it comes to faculty. I've got all kinds of information about faculty members. Okay, now, I've got a list, my faculty table is a list of faculty members. Student, it's a list of students. Course, it's a list of courses. I'll go into my faculty, my faculty course, I'll look at it, data sheet view, faculty ID. That'll be an auto numbered F name. L name. Back here, auto numbered. Look back data sheet again. I'm faculty number one. My name. Now I'm in there. Course. Let's go look at our courses. The data sheet view. Yep. Oh. Course name. I don't know if I've got that exactly right. We'll call it database concepts. Okay. 
and then student. Go look at my student in data sheet view and the data that's in there. I've got to create a new student. Call her Jane Doe. She's got a student ID of one. At the college, we've got a different numbering system because if we just went by numbers and didn't have a letter in there, man, the numbers would get huge. So we add, there'd be J, first letter in your first name, first letter in your last name, whatever it may be, followed by, I think, yeah, I think it is an S, followed by some number. Now, that helps that number not become too big by adding in or including a letter. So now I have a student, could have multiple students in my table. I've got a faculty in there and I've got a course in there. And over time I'll create another table. And this table, I'm going to call it Let's see. I'll call it a course section. Now, a course section. This course has a section ID. So we'll go look at it in data sheet view. We'll call it a, a section ID. It'll auto number for us. And that section, being this CG section, this instance of the course, will have, I'll have a course ID there. Okay. And I have a faculty ID. We've got that. I'll go ahead and faculty ID short text. It has to be the same data type. So it's a number. And this course ID is a number because it references something that's somewhere else. So now I've got my course section, so what class and who is it? I could have a day of the week, the time, whatever it may be. Maximum capacity, how many students do I want in there? 30. So there's another table that I've got. I need another one. Wow, we've got a lot of tables that we're creating. And this next table, this one we're going to call Section Student. Okay. Now in this one, it's going to come to Design View. Section student ID, and we'll have for section, make sure I've got no space in there, and then we'll have student ID, which is a number. So this one, we've got essentially a bridge between multiple
tables. So far, I've got what, five tables here. How are they related? Well, let's go look at that. Yes, I want to save it. Stretch that out. Here's a list of our table objects. I could have queries, reports, forms, each of the objects that we're building, we have here in a list. So here's all the tables that we have. So these tables, I'm collecting data about faculty members, students, sections, courses, students within the sections. So I want to look at data, tools, well, I want to look at the tools. And I could import data from a spreadsheet, bring it in and populate my tables if I wanted. For this, I'm going to go look at the relationships that exist. I'm just going to go double click my student student section, faculty, course section, and course. And I close. I just double clicked them. So do I have each one of them? Um, so I have a course. I'm missing my course section. I'll right click, show table, on a course section, and I'll close. So there's a relationship between course and course section. What is the relationship? Course ID exists here and here. So say I'm going to show, come on now. I double click course ID and we'll say let's come back again do it here create new left table name course right table name course section. So that's what I'm doing right here. Now the column, the field that we're talking about, will be course ID and course ID. I say OK. So it said from course, we're going to get course ID and in course section, it's going to relate to course ID. Hmm. I'm creating a relationship between course and course section. That's, that's fine. That's going to be a good relationship between the two because I don't want anybody referring to a course ID for courses that don't exist. So make sure it's a valid course before we create a course section. That's our integrity that we're creating. I'll enforce that integrity and make sure that it does exist. And I'll say create. Same number of fields with the same data types. Oh, you're telling me that I don't have the right data type? Let's go create, or go look. I'm going to open up my course and course section. So I've got course. Look at it, design view, course ID, ooh, short text, course section in design view, course ID, ooh, I've got number, there's a problem, I want it short text, yes, go ahead and save it as it is, come back here, let's double click that again, create new relationship, course course section, course ID, course ID. 
a lot of times I go through and do these things so you see we learn from our mistakes and I'd rather you understand why that mistake happened and understand how to work around it than hey I'll just show you the right way to do it and then when you do have a problem you don't understand how to get through it so back to where we were enforce the integrity course course ID course section course ID I create that relationship one course ID may have multiple sections one to many relationship hmm. we'll come over faculty create a new faculty course section faculty ID faculty ID did I get the data types right we're gonna find out create ah, data types were right on that one so we can see these relationships section ID primary key course ID is a foreign key here primary key here foreign key primary key so we can go create these relationships as we go and section ID We're working our way through it. And now here, I'll create this one. Section student, student, student ID, student ID, okay. Force that integrity, now look. Course section has a course and a faculty member. That section also has a relationship with many students. So to create that, I need to have this in between right here. Now that section is not gonna have many faculty members, but it's gonna have many students. So I dealt with that by creating this relationship with that section students. So that section, section ID, will have multiple students. And that's how we have that many to many relationship there. We map all this out ahead of time. Now, why do we map it out ahead of time? Because at some point we're gonna ask questions. I need a list of every student that's in section, well, the section number for this class. And I can have it spit out a report that says, this section ID has this course ID and course name and here's the faculty members name and here's a list of every student and here's a time and date for that class wait a minute I see that every term that's called a course roster the course roster has all that information in it but it has to pull that data from a database we're not throwing all the data in one big table it's not realistic so we've got to have multiple tables. There are relationships between the tables. Why, why are we doing this? To be competitive, to be able to answer those questions. One of the things I have is that student table here at the college, it has a picture of you. So I've got your ID, your first name, your last name, 
uh, keeps track of phone numbers, email addresses, and I can also, I got pictures for many of you, unless it's uh, dual enrollment, I don't have pictures all too often. But traditional students that are not dual enrollment, I've got your ID with your, you've got your student ID, your student ID has a picture of you, they store that in your student table. So if I want to see a photo roster of all the students, that's a query. Select all student photo from student where student ID is in here, course ID is the equivalent of this. As long as I ask the question correctly, I'll get that result. And that's information that could be beneficial on the first day of class. I walk into class and I've got a printed out roster of everybody's name and their face in a picture, excluding a few. So I can run through and say, hey, here's Jim in the front row. Chantel's back the second row on the left side. It helps me get used to who I'm dealing with. That's information that is usable, important to me. So these databases, we design them up front and we map them all out. We'll enter in a little bit of data so that we make sure the relationships are there, they work. Roughly ask some questions and see that they're functional and then we'll roll them out to have the data input. Now I could import the data. I'll go to external data and I could pick a table, course section. I want to import some data from some, some source. So I want to import data from a file, Excel spreadsheet, whatever it may be. Could be any. So I'm going to go get data from it. Or I'll go the other way around. I'm going to send out the roster to a spreadsheet. And then once I've got that spreadsheet set up, I'll create columns for each assignment. And I'll input your grades in there. Bam. There it is. There's another way of me keeping track of data. It helps me have that information right there, ready to go whenever I need it. So I gave that example, if you're going in to buy something, they're asking your phone number. They may ask your zip code. That's their job. They're getting paid to do it. We could joke about it, but I don't want to make anybody's job any more miserable than it already may be for them, or tough than it already may be. Life's hard as it is. So rather than berating somebody for asking you the phone number. Why are you asking my phone number? Just politely say, thank you, no. Or give them the data to help them have better information, whatever it may be. Okay. So you've got a bunch of labs, bunch of exercises. You've got an assignment support forum to go ask questions, support each other. going to have a reflection at the end of each module and think back to what we did, what worked, what didn't work, what can we do to make it better. These courses are changing every term to make things better, stronger, and see you in the next module.